Fuck yes, and welcome to the Uncultured Universe, the podcast where two friends show each other movies, TV, music, anything else just to get a little bit more cultured. I'm your host, Justin, and with me is the strikingly handsome devil himself in the uncultured hot seat, finding himself. This is Joe. Some have called me a legend. (laughs) Some say parts of Joe are legendary. Today, Mm -hmm. we are looking at the dreamy ethereal beloved classic that is legend from 1985 uh joe uh you were the most oblivious to this movie up until last year right okay we're just gonna get right into it like our promise for this podcast is the the central core of what we tend to talk about is like one person has seen the movie, the piece of media, yada, yada, the other person has not experienced. And so you get that feeling of one person reacting and experiencing it for the first time. It's never been as pure as this episode. We have maybe reached our apex in a way because before (laughs) I've always known about the movies, you know, like I know what Gremlins is. I know like of Little Shop of Horrors. I did not totally. know this movie existed until you um until you you mentioned that you wanted to cover it. Yeah. Um and it has all the stars and it's a Ridley Scott movie. Yeah. Dude. So Justin, tell me how this movie exists without existing in that way. I mean, it's it's one of those like lost to time magic pieces of of cinema. Uh it, it was the perfect storm of Ridley Scott riding the wave of like uh, Alien and Blade Runner um, and and a couple other things he did before this one. But he was riding high. Tom Cruise is this relative up and comer uh, Mm -hmm. who just came fresh off the heels of uh, Risky Business a couple years prior. And um, uh, Mia Sarah is also brand new to the scene. This is her first credit. Insane. Uh, Yeah, right. And then you get... uh, you know, uh, Tim Curry just fucking rounding it out with his theatrical background, this commanding presence, this insane movie comes together and I can't wait to talk about it with you. Uh, And I'm so glad that like you had no idea about this coming in. Listen, like, uh, we press play on the movie and immediately it is the longest scroll of text you've ever seen in your entire life. Okay. So Um, you saw, you saw, which we'll touch on this later. You watched yes. one of four versions that there were so many versions available. I think I saw the theatrical one. Yeah, we'll touch on that. Um, but yeah, before we get any further, this is uh, again the uncultured universe, or is it just uncultured universe? Right, we're dropping the the drop the the. It's cleaner. Drop the that's cleaner. Uh, uh, JT sent, said that Justin Timber, yeah, not Sean Parker. Um, yeah, uh, Uncultured Universe. This is the first month of 2024, and we're doing the Tim Curry series. So we are putting a big, fat, sparkly red exclamation point on the end of that by doing this movie, which was my pick, as Joe said. Um, yeah, let's let's dive into some particulars, and then we'll 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 get to some of your burning questions <laughs> about yeah. uh, uh, versioning and uh, what was in. Ridley Scott's mind as he crafted this. Yeah, Uh, give me the backstory. Yeah. Uh, So directed by Ridley Scott, most known for Alien, uh, The Martian, Blade Runner, Thelma and Louise, Black Hawk Down, Gladiator Connection. Uh, I had to, that was my first note is we have a secret connection to our unreleased hidden first episode uh, that may one day be released. We covered Gladiator. I think the episode was maybe two and a half hours long. Yeah, it was entirely too long. We were we were little but babes um, figuring out uh, what the structure of each episode was. And it took us until about episode three to figure that out. So 
Gladiator yeah. and Scream remain in the vaults and will be auctioned off for millions at one point. Yeah, uh, to the highest bidder. Uh, but we glad should. to be returning to Ridley. Yeah, right, to Scottville. Uh, and then most recently, uh, he did uh, Napoleon with yeah. jo- Joaquin Phoenix. Yes. Um, he co-wrote this movie with William Jortsberg. Uh, cinematography by Alex Thompson, who did Labyrinth. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you can kind of see some of those similarities there. The oh, man, I, I can see that. Yeah, a hundred percent. Alien Three, he did that one. Uh, that was directed by David Fincher, uh, and Demolition Man uh, with Sally B and uh, Sly Stone. I've never seen it. Not Sly Stone, you know, uh, Sly Stallone. Sly Stone, <laughs> you know the band. Do you think he saw the Family Stone? He was like, "Hey guys, that's us." Can you believe it? Uh, yeah, so uh, starring Tom Cruise, Mia Sarah, Tim Curry, released uh, April 18th, 1986 in America, uh, released in uh, 1985 in the UK, which we'll get to in a second. Um, music by Jerry Goldsmith, Jerry, uh, who did the original score, which is in the European version um, and the director's cut. Uh, but the alternate versions got uh, a little bit different version uh, by the um, by a band called Tangerine Dream. Where have I heard that before? I don't know. Um, okay. You just know things, I guess. I'll need to look it up. I, I feel like that is the version that I got. The version where like the music is beautiful and you always think a song is coming and then it never comes until the very end yeah you you have a song at the end of your version right yeah oh uh yeah there's there's some 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 songs throughout uh but yeah no, the, i just got the one. Oh, okay all right well then, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah the tangerine dream version is is edging you the entire time by thinking you're going to get a song until you get the very yeah. end and it's and it's good um, no, well, n- no movie has ever needed Enya more than this movie. I know. Hi, hi, hi. Yeah, yeah. It, that would, you know, the 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 entire, you know, that that uh, was like mid to late nineties, two a.m. commercial of uh, uh, best American like, contem- contemporary hits. Yeah, buy the box set for three installments of nineteen ninety nine. Yeah, but like everyone would stay up and watch that, and you're like, oh god, what time is it? It's three a.m. Oh no! But everyone knows all the songs. Uh, it's it's got the greatest hits. It's amazing. Uh, but yeah, this movie could definitely play in the background to that. I think they sync up. You know what? Qu- correct me if I'm wrong. They might sync up. Um, couple nominations for this movie. Uh, yeah. The British Society of Cinematographers Award for Best Cinematogra- Cinematography went to uh, Alex Thompson for this movie. Very cool. I've never heard of that. I didn't know that was a thing. The British I mean, Society of Cinematographers Award. These different little guilds, yeah, they each have their in- own little awards. Uh, yeah. And then they all come together as like a voting body for the Oscars. But they all they're all in their own circles in that way. Checks out. Yeah, checks out. Uh, this movie also got nommed uh, for an Oscar for best makeup. I would believe it. The makeup 100%. in this is incredible. So this, good. I'll just say it. Like I, I'm usually uh, somewhat uh, cold or negative on some of these '80s movies. This movie looks incredible. It like this, insane. this movie is like a painting. It really is. It's very painterly. Uh, all of the sets were, um, or most of like the forest sets. Uh, mm-hmm. Where there's just like dust and cotton just blowing in the wind, yeah, for no reason. It, it uh, looks like something out of like, um, oh, what's the Natalie Portman movie called? Um, not like Abomination, uh, Annihilation. Oh, Annihilation. Did you ever see that? I never saw that one. It it is very much like that, where it's kind of like they're in the Everglades, but it's very like alien vibes are around them, and it's very sunshiny, but also like maybe we shouldn't be breathing this air. <laughs> Right, yeah, um, it's it's definitely there in like a snow globe that someone just violently shook up. So you um, think all the time. this is a set? This must be a set. Yeah, right? yeah. The the a lot of the forest scenes were custom built sets. Uh, God, Ridley Scott wanted to do it like in the redwood forest uh, uh, out in California, but that was going to be too expensive. And he's like, you know, you know what? Fuck it. We're going to build sets and we're going to yeah. film it uh, in the UK on the 007 stage. Mm-hmm. Uh, which we've talked about before that that very famous soundstage at uh, Pinewood Studios. 
Do you think George Lucas walked by the studio and was like, hey, Ridley, you couldn't get the Redwoods on. That sucks, man. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> just I'm going to build the whole planet over there. Just scoffed at him and like spit on the ground and said, I'm going to go Ridley, right. You'll get there someday. And I'm going to go like, do episode one and two and three. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I jumped into Spielberg's uh, fucking convertible as they peeled ass out of there. They like threw eggs on the set. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. OK. A hundred percent. That is what happened. Uh, uh, George Lucas slides across the hood of Steven Spielberg's uh, like shiny red Corvette, gets into the driver's seat. <laughs> Spielberg gives him a little smooch on the on the cheek, and they peel away. Something the like cinematographer that. has to hold Ridley back. Like it's not worth it, man. They're just jerks. <laughs> it's like, I'm gonna get those fuckers one day. I'm gonna tear them a new one. Oh, right. anyway, That's where were what we? It sounds like. Uh, we? Uh, they were also nominated for a Saturn Award for Best Makeup, as well as a BAFTA, uh, several BAFTA awards for Best Costume Design, Makeup Artist, and Special Visual Effects. This movie, it, it, you know, is is wild to look at. Um, you know, we already touched on the the kind of the snow globiness, the uh, just the makeup in general. Mm-hmm. We're we're gonna definitely have our own Tim Curry corner, but like some of the other goblins and creatures in this movie, like impeccable nightmare inducing yeah amazing makeup they look incredible it, especially in in this era of makeup when you have these like heavily shrouded like demons and goblin like creatures either like the mouth doesn't really line up correctly the face looks like it's like disjointed a little bit or the eyes don't like fit into the face and but this like hits all of that perfectly yeah um and especially in the character of the little the little stooge goblin who we kind of follow for like the first 20 minutes of the movie. And then oh. he he kind of drops off a little bit. I don't know what happened to him. And I got kind of sad. No one knows. Um, uh, but he uh, looks incredible. Yeah. Blix, uh, Blix. Is, is the name of that of that little little goblin creature. Uh, really cool. Like the overdubs that they did on the voice, yeah. uh, the 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 actor behind the makeup and all that kind of stuff did did really, really well. I like how they look wet. Yeah, they're all like sweaty and kind of grimy and like they're I I love that they're so like happy to be evil. Like it's very natural to them from the get go. I was almost kind of on their side because I was like, he just wants it to be dark. Like he's not like trying to enslave humanity or anything. Um, I have a skin condition. Maybe maybe they (laughs) right like this. He's trying to make the world ADA compliant. Um, he's like, like, there's this thing coming called uh, global warming. I'm really just looking out for you guys. You know, I'm trying to make it dark all the time. <laughs> Seriously. Um, but you mentioned the dubbing. It felt like 80% of the voices in at least my version were dubbed. Yeah. And it kind of gave it this like eerie ethereal quality in a way. I don't know how intentional it was, but like, it was very storybookish. It was very much like narrated in that way. Um, right. Yeah, that that that's a good point. Yeah, it feels very like it's a tale out of time. It's a uh, uh, it, obviously it's an old legend kind of a thing. You know, you mm-hmm. got the 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 Lord of Darkness fighting against the world with these mythical, you know, magical uh, unicorns and all that kind of stuff. It feels like a ta- a fairy tale and like someone's voice could be doing that. that that's a, that's a neat kind of pickup. Um, I mean, it. I I of course have like my big theory uh, that I'd like to present about this movie, um, and it starts with I'll I'll get to it. I I won't do it right off the bat here, but like a lot of this movie almost feels, and this isn't a negative, but it feels like you AI generated like a a fantasy movie in the eighties. Like there's a lot <laughs> of like archetypes here. Like yeah. you. Like Tom Cruise may as well be called like hero boy. Mia Sarah may as well be called hero girl. Right. Um, And so it's I. I say that, but it's not like a generic movie in any way. There's something very different and kind Mm. of fascinating about this. Go on. Like, I'd I'd love to hear about it. Like it's it's uh, I I think it is something kind of intangible about it. Um, Can we just like. Just shoot, launch shoot, into it. Shoot my load and shoot, uh, shoot your wad all over. Give this you my podcast. thesis now. Yeah. I was trying to figure out um, 
what was like enticing about this movie because mm-hmm. like Tom Cruise as a character in this movie, maybe not the most interesting. None of the characters are really like fleshed out in a way, but at the same time, they don't really behave like humans. It's very much driven like em- by emotion. And I wouldn't necessarily include Tim Curry in this because we can have a whole Tim Curry discussion. That's part yes. of the mini series, but he's doing something completely different. But like apart from the non Tim Curry Uh, I mean, apart from the Tim Curry scenes, the closest thing I could think of to what this movie is, is a ballet. So like it, if you think of something like Black Swan, how it's it's all just like archetypes. It's like you are an adjective almost. Um, And so you get these like two hero characters that are described as like they're just pure. They're just innocent and they never really have to deal with any sort of like reckoning of the soul or anything like that. Yeah, you yeah. have these like side characters that are first name supporting last name character, you know? And so it's not necessarily these characters going on inner journeys, but they just have to express outwardly everything that they're feeling. We're not going to have some sort of like case study about the, the, inner workings uh, or thoughts of these characters. It's all on the table and it's very much like open for the audience in the same way, like a ballet, a dance and Mm -hmm. an an opera maybe would be. Uh, It seems like this is almost just filmed on stage and you're just dealing with these forces of emotion clashing against each other. And it's not, I don't know if abstract is the correct like artistic term for it. Um, It's not like abstract. It's not non-objective, but it is very much um, inhuman in the way that it's it's only it's only it's only emotion, you know, capital I T it. Yeah, it is. It's definitely um, uh, uh, loosely structured in a sense. Mm -hmm. Uh, It is more. it feels you know, interpretive. Es- it's interpretive. It's esoteric. It's that kind of thing. It's, uh, uh, you know, it's it's kind of you just open for for however you see it, and it feels very like you said. I kind of I'm I'm loving your your read on it. Like it is a tale being told, mm-hmm. uh, so it doesn't need hardened uh, um, beginning, middle, and end with definite character arcs. It is just the tale of good versus evil, light versus dark innocence mm-hmm. versus corruption um it but all the while just like it's kind of uh, unconscious it's kind of like if someone told you to to dream about these concepts this is what your unconscious brain would like yeah barf out yeah, yeah, yeah. it plays like a dream it feels like a dream i mean that's where i'm saying like the I just noticed both of our names are Joe on this screen. Hilarious. <laughs> um, that's what I'm saying. Like the the AI nature of it comes into being, and I, I that's su- that has such a negative connotation these days. But what I'm thinking is like it's it's like it takes in all of the influences of the fantasy elements that came before it as a movie, and just like it creates its own world, but it's all like painted with the colors of these movies that came before. Right. Yeah. And um, it's, it's very fever dreamy in that way of like, yeah. you need a big red, dark billowing smoke. Uh, and then the opposite side is very bright filled with glittering bullshit everywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, like the, the comparisons that you draw to this are immediate. If you look at the time, you know, you look at labyrinth, you look at willow, mm-hmm. you look at never ending story, like all those uh, contemporaries, play a part and kind of like the eighties had like where it was high time for high fantasy, you know? Yeah. Those, I mean, the ones that you just said are the big ones, right? Um, yeah. And they're the ones that you think of when watching this movie willow in particular for me, that was the one I grew up with. Um, so that's like a Ron Howard movie. You watch that, excuse me, you watch that and it's more of like a, an actual fleshed out like story with like rising, falling actions, all these characters going through like actual, like, moral ups and downs and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, So there's some complexity there, but on like a, even on like a color level, it's a little bit like washed out um, just because like that's the, it's going for a little bit more of like a grimy look. Um, And then this movie legend is like, it, it does look like a painting. It looks like a, it looks like a fairy style. It's hazy. um, It's hazy. The lights are light, you know? Yeah, it's 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 like you're watching a memory of someone trying to play back the story yeah. themselves. Yeah, and uh, I think one of one of my could... thoughts while watching it 
was like this this could all be like a flashback this is how a flashback is filmed yeah you could have a flashback or it could cut over to ben savage and an old man and it's yeah. princess bride style <laughs> and be like and then that's where they kissed and then that's the, the story's <laughs> over um <laughs> like what do you mean that's the end well that's that's the version you got kid um i want to jump over to that that uh that section here in a bit as soon as you're done giving me the plot to legend yeah, I'm, I'm glad we're trying to like tackle the plot earlier and earlier in these episodes because it, it gets insane if we don't actually give it. And when, um, we're okay. done, when we're done and you do a good job, I'm going to cheers you and we're going to talk about our cocktails before the very <gasps> end. Let's just get them all out. Yeah, let's just get it all out. OK, uh, okay. Joe is going to give the plot to 1985 slash uh, 86 uh, uh, legend starring Tom Cruise and Tim Curry. Mia Sarah, three, two, mm-hmm. one, go. Okay, Tom Cruise plays Jack. He is like a wood boy who lives in the fairy woods. Uh, Mia Sarah is Lily. She's a princess of an unknown kingdom. They have like a love affair. These unicorns uh, also exist in the woods and they somewhat control like the flow of nature. And Tom Cruise shows Lily the unicorns um, and it's forbidden. And these goblins who work for the evil darkness uh, villain nearby who's trying to release darkness upon the world also use this as an opportunity to essentially uh, capture one of the unicorns that's cut its horn off, which releases a curse of frozenness upon the land. Uh, Plot happens. Uh, They have to go and kill darkness in order to undo this curse. Uh, Lily gets captured by darkness. There's a bit of like a Beauty and the Beast vibe for half a second. Darkness is played by Tim Curry, and he just wants to like fulfill his purpose in a way. Um, And they defeat him with sunlight uh, very elaborately um and they literally just run off into the sunlight um there's there's a there's a band of woodland creatures who are also with Tom their helpers yeah well done it's, joe um it's it's the plot wise story wise um mm-hmm. uh two different things but um the the general arc of the movie is very deceivingly simple mm-hmm. right it's magical unicorn you know holds the innocence and the light of the world there are two locations in this yeah. movie, three if you count up that and down, footage. Up and down. Uh, and then in the middle, there's like the, the lake. Um, yeah, there's a swamp. Yeah, there's, a, there's also a swamp, um, which we'll talk about here in a second, because uh, I l- fucking love that scene. Um, yeah, yeah, it's light versus dark. They got to go get, take the light back. And what is the opposite of dark? It's light, and that's how you defeat it. It's very mm-hmm. big bang, boom, very simple, but like with weird little twists and turns. Um, super fun. Uh, well done, Joe. Cheers to you. You doing good, kid. Yeah, thank you. What do you got? I think we both went in a similar direction once again. Uh, I have. Um, uh, this is the Devil's Margarita. <laughs> yep. It's uh, uh, tequila, fresh squeezed lime juice, simple syrup, uh, and uh, floated with a little bit of red wine on top. It was floated. It didn't do so hot while drinking it, but. In each of the mixtures, I added uh, uh, edible glitter because there's so much fucking glitter in this movie. Yeah. Yeah. It's a very glittery movie. Um, cheers. I went in a similar direction, uh, courtesy of Jonathan. I have what we're calling Me and the Devil. Um, and so it is one part Campari, two parts vodka, three parts vermouth, uh, half a part grenadine, and then garnished with a Luxardo cherry speared upon a very pointy skewer. <laughs> <laughs> just mm. precise that is the only way i love that you're working those luxardo cherries into everything this is the only way we'll get through them yes yeah you must get through them uh we paid eight dollars for these damn it yeah very um, very negroni vibes yeah i love that uh very different vibes but like similar neighborhoods love it yeah um cool I mean, all right what do you got I, I just I think it says something that we were both drawn to the devil aspect of this movie because uh, that's obviously the curry part is the reason why we're here. But before we have curry time, uh, go on. Uh, do you have any other thoughts that we oh, should cover here? Yeah, definitely. Uh, we'll we'll tackle the um, let's 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 talk about the many versions of this movie <laughs> and the soundtrack and score. Uh, so there are four distinct cuts of this movie. Mm-hmm. There's the original European cut. 94 minutes. The American theatrical release was 89 minutes. Mm -hmm. The network TV version was 94 minutes. And then the director's cut coming in at a whopping 113 minutes. Oh, wow. Um, It's a long story, like how he he came about this. 
um, just before or like before they released it in the American market um, with some test audiences, uh, they were kind of talking about the original score of uh, like, hey, this isn't really vibing, you know, and he's like, fine, fuck it. You know what? Let's cut Jerry Goldsmith's soundtrack and I'm going to commission this artist that these this I think they're two. I think it's two. Uh, Luke, uh, Lucas and Spielberg drive by and they're like, Scott heard your score didn't work out. That <laughs> sucks, man. Oh, man. <laughs> hey, that's hey, you want to borrow John <laughs> Williams for a day? You can't. Yeah. <laughs> he's in the back and he's like, mm, mm. He's tied up. <laughs> <laughs> shut, oh, shut, shut up. He's like the gimp. Um, go on, go on. Go on. <laughs> uh, so they commissioned the band Tangerine Dream. They gave them, I think, three weeks to do the whole score. Very cool. uh, uh, or, or soundtrack score um, for the American theatrical release, which is why it's the 85, 86 release. Um, yeah. The, uh, they are a German electronic artist. Um, some, some diehards of the cult classic of this cult classic movie claim that that is the superior version. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, I think the American theatrical is what i must have watched yeah because it that's the uh, the telltale is the opening scroll Mm -hmm. uh very much you know they're like hey cool you got the opening scroll yeah never heard of that oh that's cute (laughs) we'll see you in court bud (laughs) (laughs) um but uh uh cult purists uh which you know the kids that saw this movie in theater saw it with the tangerine dream score uh, hold it, hold it true. And compared to the original, they say it is better. Um, it, I think it's a different vibe. Um, d- director's cuts, you know, often do that. Uh, mm-hmm. Case in point, most recently with uh, Zack Snyder and his Justice League cut. Uh, yeah. I think his cut is way better than the theatrical release. Um, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, I, I like the Tangerine Dream score more because it fits better. But I'm not shitting on Jerry's. <laughs> Jerry, his uh, his Jerry. his score. It's good. It services it really well, but it feels sort of generic, just because it's a typical orchestra orchestral kind of a thing. Um, but but Tangerine Dream has like the sense and the the of the time the eighties sounds to it, and it's a yeah. little more uh, tender. It's a little more, um, I don't know. I guess tender is the right word for it. it it's, it's 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 very hazy, like the screen is. It's very yeah. love story between our two dumb little lovebirds. <laughs> Those fucking dumb kids. Um, and uh, so, apart from the four distinct cuts of the film, there are several different endings, Joe. <gasps> uh, one of which uh, this is the U.S. theatrical one. This is the one you watched, uh, where Lily and Jack run off together, watching the unicorns reunite. And darkness watches from the void. I did. I did see that. I think every single movie should end with the entire cast waving goodbye to camera. (laughs) Yes. Like they and like linger on that for about 30 seconds because I loved that way, way longer than is needed. Yeah, I I wanted them to be like, yeah, we'll we'll be back in your dreams if you remember us. And then they like all fade away. Kind of. It was all a dream. Yeah. And then Tim Curry just laughing in the background. And then the the last thing being it should have been. But darkness will return. Um, I mean, it it makes perfect sense. There is no darkness without light and vice versa. Like, I guess there there could be pure darkness. But like, if you have light, you're going to have darkness. Yeah, you're going to cast some shadows. He's always going to come back. Um, you can't yeah. really eliminate him. You can just like keep him at bay. Yeah, that's right. I mean, just keep shining light on him because he's he's really sensitive. He doesn't have a sunscreen. Uh, the European theatrical version, uh, which is the original cut, is the same ending as the U.S. version, but without the darkness bit at the end. Mm-hmm. They, they kind of just like, no, he's in the void. It's like, whatever. The that dire- does speak... I, I keep interrupting you. That, that that speaks to like American style of filmmaking. Even back then is like, let's let's leave a little back door open for a sequel just in case. Hey, you know, um, Ridley Scott did say that uh, he thinks European artists or uh, audiences are a little more. They require a little more, a little more panache, which Ooh. is why his his European cut, you know, has um, a little more of that ambiguous ending and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, American audiences de- demand a little more simple. Uh, which is fair. We're we're dumb. 
um, the director's cut, which is the version I watched because I the the DVD that I own is the director's cut. Uh, Lily and Jack don't run off together. <gasps> they decide to keep things casual. You know, she gives him her ring and she's like, R remember me by this, you know, just remember me always. And he's like, okay. And he puts it on. She's like, can I come back tomorrow? And he's like, yeah, come back tomorrow. We'll hang out. Uh, and then, and then That's only, kind of sweet. and only Jack runs off into the distance. Oh, just Jack by himself back into the woods. He's like, well, see you later. Um, it's weird. It's a weird ending. Um, I like the, where they end up together, you know? Yeah. I mean, they're, they're clearly like dating, but you also get like friend vibes from them. I don't know. I don't know how old they are. I don't know where they are. I don't know anything about this movie other than it's a vibes movie. It's vibes. It's, it's vibes and glitter. And that's all you need. <laughs> um, uh, so, so speaking of those two characters, well, let's, let's jump over to the performances for a quick bit. And then we'll get to the Tim Curry of mm -hmm. it all. Um, so yeah, so obviously this is just a silly kind of off the wall movie in a sense. Mm -hmm. um, and the performances illustrate as such, um, starting with, but not limited to, the names of the characters are all over the map and are insane to me. Um, you get Brown Tom and Screwball, the little like dwarven elf Yep, woodland nymph kind of guys. The, they, the, the the fun little old brothers, yeah. Yeah, the, definitely Hobbit dwarf vibes, which mm -hmm. like they totally could have pulled off a Lord of the Rings live action in the eighties with shit like that. Like that would have ripped. I think. yeah, uh, would have looked great. Uh, uh, Honeythorn Gump with that Frankie Muniz looking motherfucker. So I was watching it with our friend and she fully like she she called it. She was like, oh, that's that's Frankie Muniz. And I had to kind of like look it up later. I was no, like, wait, not. do the timelines line up for that to be Frankie Muniz? I mean, it's like it's it's he was like Navy an actor. Yeah. 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 Frankie Muniz was like not even born when this movie came out. Um, Blix, the one of the coolest goblins. Um, I love that he speaks in rhyme. Yes. Only him. No one else does. And it's so cool. Like it's kind of silly at first, but then you're like, that's kind of rad. And he kind of like provides the comic relief. He's got these little one liners where he kind of stands up to the dark Lord where he's just like, are you going to, you going to tell me what to do or not? Or like, I like to, in they have initiative and I like to encourage them. My Lord. Yeah. He's like a little manager of his goblin team. Like he it's has to great. like process time cards and stuff. Yeah. Uh, a couple of my favorite uh uh, rhymes that he says is, you know, mortal world turn to ice. Here be goblin paradise. Right. Like, do they want things cold? Because it's like there's fire all over the place in their little hideout. I mean, that's I light. Te that's light technically, but like right. not light from the sun. You know, the light from fire is cool. Light from like fusion, not cool. <laughs> Yeah, it's um, it's a very anti-nuclear propaganda message. Uh, another cool character name is Una. Una the mm -hmm. fairy. Uh, very Listen, cool. Like Tinkerbell vibes. That is a piece that I wanted more of. It got very interesting when the fairy turned from like a little light speck into a little girl who also wants to like really get it on with Tom Cruise. And I was like, wait, is she kind of evil because she's kind of antagonizing when she's like a little light speck yeah mm -hmm. she helps them and it's like it's like na navi and zelda or like little tinkerbell yeah. listen and then yeah hey and then she becomes she like shows her true form to tom cruise which is just like a fairy girl but right. then you realize like it's supposed to be a secret that she's a girl and then when she finally reveals herself to the other teams they like are shocked and she's kind of like they're against her. It's Fuck. very weird. Yeah. When she turns gump, like fucking hisses at her. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I want to know what the history is there. I wanted more of that, but then she, she very much seems like she's about to like curse them and stuff, but then she just kind of helps them out of the cell yeah. and goes back to little light spec. I, I wanted more. I wanted, I wanted more, more too. Yeah. I wanted more too. Yeah. It, it is definitely interesting. Her, her like crazy, like just licked my finger and stuck it in the socket hair. 
mm-hmm. is so iconic and cool but, and her like wild blue eyes yeah um, and are, she wants you know, a kiss which you never okay. give to a fairy don't don't ever give them anything don't you know anything like don't go into like a a, a fungus circle in the woods don't yeah. speak your name like there's there's a whole fairy lore about mm-hmm. that um which is very cool to see uh, and then just rounding out the names, uh, we we go from like super cool fantasy world made up names to Jack, Jack, Lily, and then it's like, uh, well, I mean, I guess Jack and Lily in darkness. I I want like a trio of little kid Halloween costumes. That's Jack, Lily, and darkness. Uh, you have little wood Zelda boy. You have princess girl, and then you have horn devil. Horn devil man. Uh, super cool. And then uh, my favorite character in the entire movie, Meg Mucklebones. Is that the is that is that the swamp lady? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank tell you. me, Meg Mucklebones. Yeah. Tell uh, me more there. Uh, what's what's going on? What what do you love? She's terrifying. Mm-hmm. It is a horrifying scene, but it is done so well, and it's done practically. Mm-hmm. Um. That scene in particular is like Jack's first run in with like, like t- that's his first challenge. That's his first hurdle. Yeah. Um, his first time swinging a sword and he's like not so sure of himself, but uh, physically he's not sure of himself, but he relies on his wit and he's like shamelessly flirting with this swamp witch monster lady and right. it works. Um, but like her, her long fingers have always stuck with me and just, the way she was able to like emote this stuff is so funny. And amazing. yeah, she kind of, she springs out of the bubbly water and her arms already look like they have like 10 more joints than normal. She's got like this like praying mantis kind of look. Um, it is a great look. Uh, and then he, what he cuts her head off uh, at some point. Yeah. Like by distracting her, by getting her to like gaze at her reflection in his shield. And Everyone she, wants to kiss Jack. He's got kissable lips. Yeah. Um, uh, but I mean, that's that's not to say that like, you know, that, that was definitely her downfall. Like you kiss Jack, you kiss Jack, you get you get whacked. Yeah. <laughs> Lily needs to get watch whacked. out. Yeah. Um, all right. Let's talk about Tom Cruise for a second. In this role, he is all teeth, thighs and hair. That is all you get. I'm glad we brought up the thighs because <laughs> fucking they're. <thighs. laughs> There is a moment in this film where they they essentially the 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 winter has come. We have to save the remaining unicorn. We have to go defeat darkness. They answer the call to action. And so Gump, his little forest elf friend, says, hey, we've got this like suit of armor randomly in this cave over here. Why don't you go try it on? And you're like, OK, now we have like our iconic. He's 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 aren't he's suited up. Uh, he's going to pull out his lightsaber, his sword, all that good stuff. And we're going to go charge into battle. He comes out in a gold kind of like scaly overpiece, a sword, shield, no pants, no pants, <laughs> nothing going on there. Um, he's wearing like what I'm assuming are like cloth shorts and then boots. Yep. It's it's a cheap shot to say all I could think of was like Reno 911 sheriff, <laughs> but like that's what it is. Um, yeah. And was... I, I applaud the film in every way, to be clear, uh, for going for that. Yeah, he, he probably came to, to Ridley Scott and was like, hey, so when, when did the pants come in, you know, from, from wardrobe? And Ridley Scott's like, son, there ain't no pants. <laughs> <laughs> there ain't no pants in this movie. <laughs> Ran out of budget. Heard you couldn't afford pants. <laughs> I love this bit. I love this bit that keeps going. This is great. We'll do a super cut of it. It's um, like Mark Hamill's in the back now, and he like throws paint at them. <laughs> hey, how to go, kid? Way to go, kid! You really got him with that paint. Like, did I do good, Mister Lucas? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You did. Settle down. Settle down. Uh, uh, he gently, like strokes his cheek. We're making George Lucas out to be a fucking creep. <laughs> he very well may be, but I don't know. He's, he's probably... Yeah, this, this episode's really going to make waves and get back to him. Uh, um, uh, his boyish charm um, um, comes through. Again, this is like his fifth movie um, that he, he ever did. Right. Uh, 
but uh it, it works like he's he's iconic in this one to me this is my first memory of tom cruise as well um, he doesn't speak for a while and i was like oh are they going like full zelda forest lad and he's just going to be like the silent type and then he just like talks in an american accent like he's it's it's normal um yeah yeah what do you think his his role is just as a human is he like a human raised by fairies or something yeah, um, there's like, something magical about him in a sense, but like not quite like wood nymph, woodland fairy creature. He's just a a boy of the wood. He just lives right. in the woods, uh, but he's wild, you know, and that's why he kind of crawls around on all fours like a chimp because um, he, he lives out in the trees and, and, you know, sings to the to the bird. He speaks uh, rabbit and squirrel and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think of it as like a human that they found in like a basket as a baby. And now he has adopted the woods and vice versa. And yeah. now he is wooing the princess of the the neighboring. I think town, she, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I think she is, she just came across. It's Tarzan vibes in a sense. Uh, George yes. of the Jungle. Very kind much. of style of just like I came across this wild man in the woods and. I want me a piece of that kind of a thing. I don't mind the lack of backstory. Like, let's just get into it. Yeah, um, right. Like, you don't want to see the meeting, the meet cute and all that stuff. She's like, I'm going to go see Jack. And she's like, what are you going to show me to Jay today, Jack? And he's like, I'm going to go show you some fucking unicorns. It's awesome. But don't touch like, him. Jack, you're such a great friend. You're like my brother. <laughs> and he's like, <laughs> all right. Well, okay. <laughs> um, I'm going to I'm going to shock you with some of these uh, other considerations for the role of Jack. Tell me which one shocks you the most. Johnny Depp. OK. Jim Carrey. Robert Downey Jr. Wow. Um, considered for the role. All considered for this role. I can't picture Robert Downey Jr. playing like Forest Boy. So probably that Jim Carrey. I can see him doing like the physicality. Um, and Johnny Depp seems like the pick opposite Cruz back then. Yeah, right. For sure. Uh, Robert Downey Jr. I just don't consider a part of that group. See, back in the 80s, though, Downey Jr., he had the he had the unibrow going for him, which would have definitely read a as a lot of unibrow in this movie. Very yeah, bold, very bold brows, uh, which I'm glad to see made a comeback. Uh, he did his own swimming stunts. Tom Cruise is going to Tom Cruise. He was doing it as early as this, uh, mm -hmm. which is really cool um a lot of diving into pools yeah yeah uh let's see mia sarah first on the scene uh this is her first uh acting credit the year after she did ferris bueller's day off uh, -huh. uh good for her she is great in this she's like she good. is very good i i mean the obvious like comparison is to another movie we watched, which is Labyrinth, and you have Jennifer Connelly in there kind of playing like this dark haired woman in white navigating this crazy world. Jennifer Connelly kind of stays, I'm not going to say like one note, um, but she's very level keel the entire movie. Whereas like Mia Sarah, I wasn't expecting to go it to go the places it went because she's this like princess archetype. She gets captured at some point with the remaining unicorn and finds herself in the, the darkness castle slash tree, uh, whatever we want to call it. It's this like dungeony place. And then the movie takes a fascinating turn mm -hmm. um, because you find out like we can we can get into the darkness of it all. Yes. Darkness okay. is this like horned devil creature who. You I mean, like through no fault of his own falls, falls for me as Sarah's princess character. And he's immediately like, oh, like I I want to turn her, you know, I want to bring her over to the dark side so that she can essentially like rule with me. Um, and so instead of like her kind of like playing princess peach and just being like immediately no. And I'll wait for Mario to come save me. Like it becomes this like dark night of the soul, dark dance, which is. literally becomes a dance where these like very interesting looking like characters appear to her in whatever dungeon she is in after she kind of runs around the, the basement of this castle. Mm -hmm. And there's like this like waltz with the devil that happens. It's very interpretive. It's very 
metaphorical and she goes from this like white uh wearing dress into she essentially like merges with uh this like darker character and becomes this like darker princess yeah um, i i wasn't expecting it to go that way and she gives she sells this performance it's 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 the black swan of it all right it it's really like, is she's giving pure innocence but then she's also giving like sultry temptress once she essentially gets taken over by darkness yeah which is really cool i love that scene of like the the dress come to life kind of mm -hmm. like dancing flirting it with her looked incredible yeah uh the i mean like they they went hard for yeah. this movie with the the effects and and like it's all practical like it's practically done and it's so cool um but yeah like when she does the turn and she's like in the dark makeup and the deep cut of the dress and she's just like embodying oh. it and you're like is she gonna you get like her? center she... boob is what you get yeah yeah you boob for sure uh, you think like, is she going to turn? Is she not? She's sticking to her guns, but like you can see the battle of like temptation kind of wavering through her. Yeah. Uh, uh, through a lot of it. Um, and then you get the super cool scene of, and this is the introduction to it of Tim Curry, like coming through the mirror mm -hmm. and his sparkly fucking hoof just comes his little, in. his little Krampus foot. Yeah. It just, just steps out and it is amazing. Um, so, here's a here's a little little background why i chose this movie this is my earliest memory of a movie period oh um, hell yeah justin we have I, finally found it yeah this is the my nexus point i don't remember where i saw it i don't remember how i don't remember if we rented it or if i if we owned it or whatever but like i always remember like this is the first it, memory of my mind of like okay that's what a movie is this is what a movie soundtrack kind of sounds like, like the, the music from it always like the way I described it as a kid growing up to myself was like, the music just sounds true. Mm -hmm. And like, there's, there's some, some cute little, little innocent, uh, innocence and truth about that too. Um, but like, I always have that vision of like the foot and just like the red giant horns, even without the face really. Um, and then just like the ethereal dreaminess of it. So this was my like first core memory of what a movie is. Um, and it's so cool that like it's tied to Tim Curry where he Tim Curry where he's playing like the fucking like iteration of the devil. It it is a movie that wears its heart on its sleeve almost like admirably, right? It's never trying to like wink at the camera. It's never trying to be sarcastic in a way that like a Marvel movie these days would be like. Oh, yeah, it's so the, serious. The good is good, and when it becomes bad, it's bad, and the bad is always bad. Like it's it's not like, I mean, let's let's get into the Tim Curry of it all. Like he his character of darkness is introduced for like a a scene and a half at the beginning of the movie. Like you you get him kind of like essentially being bored and without purpose in his like tr tree castle because he has to stay there because it's always dark, and so he sends out his goons to go kill the unicorns to erase the sun from the sky essentially and so immediately he's launching into this like shakespearean soliloquy uh, about how he is just um evil and he's trying to fulfill his dark purpose and he's so lonely and then the movie boldly like does not come back to him for a good hour. a while yeah yeah and then the last 20 minutes of the movie are his essentially and so yeah. he commands the scenes that he's in though and he's it's, not he's not the comedic element really uh, which right. we're so used to with curry he's the opposing force which we get a taste of in you know comparison and we'll talk about this in a second the uh of uh, uh cardinal richelieu mm -hmm. of this villainous vile t t seeped in red kind of character and um he plays a really good villain Mm -hmm. um and, and it's just you cannot take his eyes off of him in any of the scenes um even though like it doesn't look like tim curry at all at all he is lost in the makeup but yeah. that is fine because even though they pitched his voice way down it's got still has his speaking cadence and it's still just oozing that sexiness about it 
Well, I was wondering, he's obviously wearing like a cake's worth of makeup. Is it him in the costume or is he like a dub? Because they they did dub so much of this movie. This man went through (laughs) five and a half hours of makeup uh, every day. His entire body being encased in makeup and effects. Yeah. Uh, So much so so much makeup that he had to spend an hour plus in the bath just to liquefy all the goop and like liquid adher- adherent agent on his body. My God. Uh, he went through it. He was on 18 inch stilts on his feet, uh, learning to walk on hill on stilts and run. Uh, that's him running. Um, and then he had those giant three foot fiberglass horns attached to oh, his wow. head and like a bracing thing on his neck that went down his back. Uh, and like full body suit and all this kind of stuff. Homeboy went through it. Um, but yeah, I just want to know like the weight of all of this. I have no idea how much, how heavy it was to carry around, but like enough for him to like emote and walk around and fucking swing a sword. Um, yeah. which is cool. But yeah, so from hoof to horn tip, he was about 13 feet tall. This yeah. um, massive, like I would, so first of all, side note, like if, if God and the devil are real, God, I hope the devil looks like this. Like <laughs> so fucking cool. Like just this giant hulking figure, uh, it is so just amazing and iconic. It is like a classic devil look. Um, it's, it's what you get when you Google devil. I mean, these days in a movie, it's going to be a lot more edgy. It's going to be some, some old woman who's saying fuck and that's the devil. Um, uh, but no, this is like the, the absolute like devil archetype, like, uh, maxed out to a hundred, even um, though he's not like really like the devil, like Satan right. or Lucifer or whatever. He is the Lord of darkness. And he's like, I don't know who he's praying to or talking to when he's talking about mother and father and stuff like that. Like, who knows? Yeah. I don't know. It's so cool. Just and I love that the, they don't the answer. old gods. Yeah. You don't need it answered. Um, he's so he's not really like the devil. He's more like a fawn in a sense. Like he's got the hoofs he's, and the, he's a fawn. He's a little, he's a little hell boy. He's, he's fawn as hell though. Um, yeah. His his just performance. He's kind of fine as hell. If a we're fawn being honest. as hell. Yeah. <laughs> the, like, there's the scene when he's he's just trying to convince Lily to just like stay and talk with me. And yeah. he just he's like leaning against the table, just like super casual. And it's like, that's fucking rad. Why is that so rad? I mean, it it's very um Phantom of the Opera. It's very Beauty and the Beast kind of like this mm-hmm. idea of like he's a devil, but he's a gentleman. And, you know, and like he he'll treat you right. His purpose in life is to be the bad guy, and that's why he's the bad guy. But he also like has wants and needs of his own, and he essentially has manners, right? Uh, he's he's very learned. He's very- All this comes down to maybe I want a version of this movie where she stays with him, and we get to see their story. Like, would that be the worst thing? He doesn't seem like he wants to like hurt her. He seems like he'll be good for her, you know, like. She's He's looking got for a something. rocking got... body. Oh, dude, rock hard. Um, <laughs> this this dude rules. Uh, yeah, he. So we already talked about it, like how he's on screen for like maybe twenty minutes, if that, maybe fifteen. Yeah. Um, so hardly at all comparatively through the whole, uh, which regardless of what cut you watch, but um, it, this that's the visual that sticks with you in the movie. Yeah. Um. And that's the performance that most people can really think of uh, just because it is it's 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 not just the work that went into because a ton of work did. Yes, for the makeup and all that kind of stuff. But he was still able to put on a fucking like incredible performance. Yeah. Yeah. They they left some room in the face and obviously with his voice. And that's kind of where he shines. Yeah. Like uh, he wanted to have his eyes not be covered up, but they were like. No, dude, fuck that. We're going to put these really cool, terrifying yellow contacts in your eyes to make you look like a goat monster. And it's way cool. I love I love that. I also love the early scenes where it's just like pure darkness and his it's essentially like a black light. So his nails and his eyes are glowing, but they're like lime green in a way. And so you don't get like the full shrouded in fire red effect. It's mostly like 
you're playing laser tag with the devil. Mm -hmm. Um, And (laughs) that also looks very cool, but in a very different way. It's like black and lime as opposed to like red and gold. Yeah, very cool. Um, I love it so much. It's 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 such a neat stylistic choice. There is Mm -hmm. there were so many stylistic choices in this movie um, and, and they all sing. They all fucking sing um, so well. So I had this little bit in here that I want to talk about before we get to the end game. Um, let's 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 look at the two movies we talked about for this Tim Curry series. Uh, your pick from 1993, The mm-hmm. Three Musketeers, and this one from 1985, uh, uh, Legend. So looking at Richelieu versus Darkness, the two performances. Um, I mean, I already kind of hit hinted at it. You know, they they are both fucking slaying in red. Mm-hmm. Uh, he knows his color. Um, both both characters are like dramatic, theatrical, vying for power in a way. Um, but both also still pretty like forthcoming and sexy, right? Tim Carey's going to play a villain, but he's also going to strike a silhouette. Like you're going to oh, know he's got, he's serving cunt uh, yeah. for sure. Um, yeah, so there's while there's not a lot of space for darkness to kind of move around and explore quite as much as we see Richelieu, uh, like literally moving from scene to scene and kind of like f- f- flowing with his fucking cape and stuff like that, um, he is still imposing and terrifying all his own. I mean, and maybe because he is a 13 foot demon monster, but it's still it's still cool to watch with sick abs sick ripped heart i mean that's not to say richelieu probably also had abs too mm-hmm. i bet he was hiding a, a an eight pack under there he throws it off for the final battle and he's just like <laughs> jacked and like glistening and smooth <laughs> <laughs> yeah like unexplained you know because it's like it's france so all you get is you get cheese and wine and he's like yeah it's exactly um come fight my god abs <laughs> Uh, Richelieu, I think, is also just as terrifying, but in a more like real, obviously human way. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, like that's more terrifying in a sense. And he is a lot of like the comedic uh, force in the Three Musketeers, whereas in Legend, Darkness really is like a, a I don't know if it's like a tragic villain. I, I feel like if we had more time with him, he, he doesn't seem to have like a grudge against humanity in a way it's mostly like he has this like urge to shroud the world in darkness because it's his purpose and he can't fight his destiny yeah he's like uh he's like loki in that way right he has uh he's burdened with uh um oh shit what is it with glorious purpose he's burdened with glorious purpose (laughs) he has this thing that he has to do and he's just like hey man sorry about it like uh i hate the i hate the light uh love the dark so i'm I'm sorry you didn't want to be my bride and live with me in my castle. Yeah, I'll sorry. have fun in the wo- the woods. <laughs> sorry, I have uh, uh, offended you with my friendship. Um, so, Joe, out of the two, Richelieu and Darkness, who would you rather pet sit for? Who would I pet sit for? Yeah, like who I'm you, pet you a, sitting them, or I'm pet sitting their house. Their house, their pet, their <laughs> respective pets. They call you up, like, hey, hey, Joe, can you come pet sit this weekend? Uh, tell me what the pets are. Uh, so, uh, Richelieu has like a, a hairless cat. Um, and I'm going to say darkness probably has just like a, a really breathy mouthy pug. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, Everybody loves him. Everybody loves him. Uh, yeah. so, um, uh, yeah, I'll pet sit for Richelieu. I want to hang out in the palace. Oh, right. Like lots of room to run. You know that there's like a cat wing. Yeah. yeah. Super fun. No uh, kitty. uh let's see okay let's say you double booked a night on the town with both of them fuck you you messed up your calendar you're booked for for the same time slot to go hang out on opposite sides of the city uh who do you call to let down and go party with the other oh fuck i will ooh. I'll call Richelieu to let him down and go party with darkness, but I'll tell him where we're partying because I feel like he will be so offended by that, that he'll want to come over and like, uh, plot revenge against me. And that's where I'll like be like, Richelieu, have you met darkness? And then they, get Oh, it on. in front of you. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I love it. I love the way you, you do that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, last, this is just the last little silly one. This is kind of a warm up for Endgame. 
Um, let's say one of them calls you out of the blue asking for a quick Venmo of $300, no questions asked. Who do you give it to without hesitation? Oh, darkness. Um, <laughs> Rishlu set up some sort of like virus thing where he gets the 300, but he also gets access to my bank accounts. Darkness, I feel, has like an honor code that he lives by and will pay me back with interest, even I if the interest that. is like blood vials. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Rishlu is trying to like contain his laughter. Yeah. Like, hey, just click on the link. And send me three hundred dollars. <laughs> it's it's gonna be fine. <laughs> oh, that's good. Um, I love that. So, Joe, what are some of your final thoughts on uh, on 1985's Legend? It surprised me again. I f- y- you walk into the first couple minutes of this movie and you're like, okay, this is this is this is fairy tale. The movie. This is this is eighties eighties fantasy. The movie. But no, it goes in some interesting directions. I mean, Tom Cruise and friends do go on a more of a typical hero rescue mission. They right. spend about 30 minutes setting up mirrors. It's nothing but setting up mirrors for like the last half of this movie. It's a lot. Of setup. Once Tim Curry gets into it and he kind of has his scenes with Mia Sarah, credit to Curry, like that's the those are the moments that really shine for me with this movie yeah. where I'm just like, I'm kind of waiting on the edge of my seat. I don't know what, what crazy thing is going to happen next. Cause in this movie, it feels like anything could happen. How could you ever know? Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. That's what you want out of a, out of a movie like this. Yeah. Of just like, I I'm ready to be surprised. Fucking surprise me. Um, I don't need structure. I don't need a plot. I'm an adult. Like I can read, like, let me do my thing. Um, of the two movies, do you think this was a good cross section of Tim Curry's career? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I think you'd be hard pressed to find an interesting movie where Tim Curry isn't playing the villain in a way, even if we're talking like Rocky Horror. But mm-hmm. I think on the Tim Curry villainy scale, we did pick the more showy comedic side versus the more showy Shakespearean side, and so yeah. you get those two parts that are that seem kind of foundational to him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, uh, I think these were these were great picks as well. Um, v- very different, uh, very indicative of the individuals. Yeah, uh, I'm I, I'm glad you let it drop that this is kind of your first movie memory because this time last year we were talking first and mine was Bugs Life, and so we're really kind of book de- bookending the year in that way. Bugs yeah. Life and Legend. That's how we do it, you know. Double feature that. Double fist it. Um, yeah. <laughs> so fun. Uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to doing more of these where we kind of look at the actor, the performer, the writer, mm-hmm. the director, and kind of stuff as we move about 2024 uh, at uh, Uncultured Universe. So, uh, Joe, that was legend. Um, so much fun. I'm glad you were tickled by it. I really wasn't sure how you were going to receive it um, yeah. because it is so wacky and weird. I'm glad that you just let it wash over you and you just went on vibes. It's different. I'm into it. Uh, all right, so we're gonna move into the end here of end games, and we're gonna wrap up. Let's see, let's uh, let's see what this is all about. With that shot, I forgot that he also has like really tiny nips. He's got te- yeah. teeny little nips, little devil nips. I didn't nips. forget. <laughs> I never forget a nip. Uh, Joe, we're playing Legends, the legend of the legendary Legends game. Um, there's a lot of media out there that feature the word legend in some capacity. I'm going <laughs> to ask you questions and give you uh, multiple choice. Uh, are you ready, Joe? Do you get it? Do you get what we're doing here? I get I I absolutely get it. Yeah. Wonderful. Number one. <laughs> Right off the bat, what sports film from the year 2000 starring Will Smith was an infamous box office bomb that was about the game of golf and loosely based on the Hindu sacred text, the Bhagavad Gita? I'd like to solve the puzzle. This is the legend of Bagger Vance. Amazing. Well done. Didn't even need the multiple choice. Insane movie. (laughs) I never saw it. Um, 
Question two, what Nickelodeon game show from the 90s featured a fictitious temple filled with lost treasures protected by mysterious Mayan temple guards? I've never seen this, and I don't understand the structure of it, but this is Legends of the Hidden Temple. Oh, my God, Joe. You are two for two. You are swinging hard. Here we go. Question three. According to the Legend of Zelda lore, Ganondorf, or Ganon, uh, is the de facto antagonist for a lot of the game series and overall franchise. What race is he a part of from Hyrule? Is he a part of the Rito, the Gerudo, the Goron, or the Zora? He is a Gerudo male, the first Gerudo male to be born in like generations. I'm, yeah. I'm currently pay- playing Tears of the Kingdom now. That game fucking rules. Yeah. Um, question four Anchorman, the legend of Ron Burgundy stars <laughs> Will Ferrell as the titular newscaster. What was the name of his pet dog in the movie? Oh, God. Wait, I know this. Okay. Because it gets kicked off the bridge and then he <laughs> screams its name. Um, Oh, fuck, 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 fuck. Okay. Um, it's two syllables. I can give you is multiple it like, choice. Is it like Benson or something like that? Mm, give, me, right. give me the multiple choice. Give me the is multiple it choice. Buster, Baxter, or Beaver? It's Baxter. It's Baxter. Well, I, I, I was in the ballpark. Okay. You, you were there. Uh, question five. In campaign mode of the popular first-person shooter Halo, what is the proper order of difficulty ratings from least to most difficult is it easy normal hard legendary is it easy normal legendary heroic or is it easy normal heroic legendary when i played uh halo with my friends growing up all we ever did was play like freestyle in blood gulch or like desagulation gulch or whatever yeah and I just like spammed the rocket launcher because I wasn't good at video games. Uh, but I will go with um, your last one, which was easy, normal, heroic, legendary. I think very good, very good, yeah. well done. You were five. That makes, five. Sense. That makes are, sense. Yeah, right. Uh, I mean, you know, who knows? Uh, question six: In the popular TTRPG Dungeons and Dragons, which we are both familiar with, uh, there is a unique gameplay mechanic for high-level creatures that grant that creature and. Insp- uh, 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 in particular, extra abilities outside of their turn in combat. What are they known as? Uh, are they legendary Those actions? Those are known as legendary actions. Ah, god damn it. You got it. Give me give me the multiple choice. I want to hear what you're saying. Uh, legendary action, legendary force, or legendary maneuver. Oh. Ooh. I was yeah. going to throw you for a loop, but no, you got it. Six out of six. Question seven. What biographical crime thriller from 2015... <laughs> was adapted from the book The Profession of Violence, The Rise and Fall of the Gray Twins, or the Cray Twins. I'm going to hearken back to your text to me as I was about to watch this movie. You said, if you're watching Tom Hardy, you've gone too far. This is the movie Legend. (laughs) Yeah, well done, well done. Uh, Question eight, the 47th book in the original Goosebumps series. Uh, What was the title of of that book, which follows two siblings lost in the woods, Filled with strange creatures and ancient Vikings. Is God. it Lost I haven't Legends? read this, but it is Legend of the Lost Legend. Yeah, Justin, very... you gotta let me answer before you give me multiple choice. I am on fire right now. You are. Okay. Well, I'm gonna just I'm not gonna give you multiple choice on these last two then. Watch me regret it. Yeah. You are instantly gonna regret it. Uh number nine, in the 2007 zombie apocalyptic heartbreaker, I am Legend, again starring Will Smith. What was the virus scientist tried to genetically re-engineer? in an attempt to cure cancer that resulted in affecting 99% of the population. Uh, um, I'll give it a shot. I mean, is it like the, the common flu or whatever, the common cold? No. Is it smallpox? No. Okay, give me, give me, the, give me the choices. It, uh, uh, it was measles. It was measles? Yeah. Justin, did you have multiple choice? I did, but... Just you were so confident. You were so confident in it. <laughs> <laughs> All I right. You've gotten measles. It's fine. Yeah, it's fine. Uh, but I'll still give that one to you because mm-hmm. I kind of fucked you on the question. Uh, last one. Internationally tolerated drag queen superstar Jinx Monsoon amassed four legendary legend stars in what season of the drag race competition? Oh, God. You want the multiple? You no, know I haven't. 
You know I haven't seen you want the multiple race choice. Yet. Yeah, give me the multiple choice. Is it RuPaul's Drag Race All Stars Seven? RuPaul's Drag Race Season Twelve or RuPaul's Drag Race UK versus the World? I'm gonna say All Star Seven. You would be correct, Joe. <gasps> Is it really? You did it. You did it. Well done. Uh, you My did God. incredibly well. At that People game. call me legend. The, I mean, they say Joe is legendary. Joe is. Can you start to... calling me legend. Can you start that, please? <laughs> Are you? Gonna... <laughs> please, can you do that? I would like that very much. Please, I would. <laughs> Are you going to do? Like, my pronouns are legend. <laughs> um, so much fun. You did. You did really well. Uh, uh surprisingly, uh, but not surprisingly, you know. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah. So that was that was legend from 1985. Uh, and concluding our Tim Curry series, uh, where are we going next month, Joe? That's a great question that I uh, probably need to look up. You're going to defer to me because I got the calendar over here. Why don't I defer to you? Great. Uh, so <laughs> February, we're going to be going uh, on a jaunt to look at Baz Luhrmann, oh, the man. director I am so excited. Okay, I'm back. Uh, yeah. Yes. We're going to look at Baz Luhrmann, the director. We have covered uh, his movie Moulin Rouge last year as part of our musicals miniseries. Um, and uh, coming up, uh, the episode that I'm going to talk about is a movie that is very uh, near and dear to my heart. We're going to watch Strictly Ballroom, mm -hmm. which is the first in his uh trilogy of i think it's the red curtain trilogy yeah. yep um and i mean more on justin's pick but you can probably fill in the blanks following that maybe uh, if you follow we'll, us on instagram you can see it we'll round off some stuff um strictly ballroom is one of his first movies it's a mockumentary uh in australia about a ballroom dance competition i can't wait um and it's hilarious and fantastic. I can't wait for it. It's going to be great. Uh, we're going to be talking we, about love. We're going to be talking about showmanship. It's going to be great. Um, check us out uh, wherever you get your podcasts. Check us out on YouTube. Check us out on TikTok. Uh, at Uncultured Universe. Wherever you get all that, that good stuff. Give us a like. Give us a follow. Subscribe. Do all the things. Uh, and we'll catch you guys later. Bye. Peace.